you there? Sorry, I'm in the middle of like making lunch too. We are now recording. <laughs> so I'll be going on and off camera while I chew. <laughs> I love it. Pam, so, thank you for joining us today to talk about um, business insurance and different types of insurance vehicles and strategies that uh, small business owners should be mindful and aware of. I know we're going to learn some really good tidbits today. Insurance is always sexy. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And make it sexy. <laughs> All right. So I will hand it over to you. Welcome. Well, thank you, ladies, for having me. Welcome. Absolutely. And then, I don't know, do you want me to just dive right oh. in? Yes, do you need to uh, share your screen? Oh. I'll make you a co-host. OK, there you go. All right, so let me. Ooh. We lost you. <laughs> oh, did you? Ooh. You know, I... I see Boreal. How do you say that? Boreal? Boreal. I like it. Very cool. There you go. So, I'm trying to share. Do I have to do anything? You should do um, share screen. Do you see a green button on the bottom? Oh, there we go. And then select the screen that you want to share. I know I was saying it's crazy. Everyone trying to figure out Zoom at once, like in the whole world. <laughs> <laughs> using it for everything. <laughs> I did buy some Zoom stock though. Oh, smart. <sighs> I apologize, ladies. I thought I had we can always cut the recording until like it actually starts. So do not worry and I'll edit it, yeah. Okay, okay. we are recording. So we wanna welcome Kim Dansby Berry um, of Burial Insurance Brokerage. So I don't know if you wanna share your screen of yourself or just keep, keep this going, but thank you for speaking on insurance for business at the library. We're really happy to have you. Thank you, thank you. And um, in an effort to be, since I'm technically challenged, we'll keep it here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, excited to share insurance savvy business 101 tips with your audience. I think it's a good time for that. Sammy and I were talking. <laughs> yes. Well, it is. A lot of people don't understand why. They're told they need a certain policy. They don't understand usually why. So we'll go over some of that today. Great. And then did you want me to just jump in? You can just jump in unless you want to introduce yourself and say a little bit more about yourself. You can do that. It's up to you. All right. So I am Kim Berry. I am owner of Real Insurance Brokerage. We are a women minority owned agency uh, working with clients in New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. I founded Bereal after a number of years on the corporate side, uh, working for other property and casualty agents, Fortune 200 companies, uh, and decided that there was a need uh, for a level and depth of information that a lot of the, I felt the major carriers couldn't or didn't provide. We're completely independent, so we represent a number of different carriers. Um, and I also feel that that's important because then we're not held to a certain number or standard. We can hold ourselves to a higher standard by doing right, really what's right by the client. All right, so today I wanted to touch on a couple of things that typically impact small business owners or business owners. That includes your liability insurances, your property and auto, your disability insurances, why those are important, especially at times like this, and medical. 
um, insurance. By any other name, it's called a hedge, it's a security, a safeguard, surety. It's a contract between you and the insurance carrier where you are moving your risk from yourself to the carrier, which is the, why insurance is important. We cover diff, uh, a variety of markets. What are considered casualty markets are everything from your professional and general liability insurances, your cyber liabilities, uh, your directors and officers, business owners, commercial auto, inland marine, um, and your workers' comp. And I'll go back to the screen for a second because I just realized what also is on this screen under the property markets is vacant buildings. So a lot of people don't realize if you're purchasing a property and you're getting ready to do construction on it and it's not inhabited, you might want to consider getting a vacant building policy to cover the contents of the building. Right. We're going to start with liability coverage. There are typically two types of liability coverages that people can purchase. One is general liability and the other is professional liability or sometimes considered errors and omissions. Your general liability is gonna protect your business in the instance that somebody has a bodily injury claim. That can include an injury that occurs either on your premise, if you have a brick and mortar, or um, if you are doing work on their property and somehow as a result of your not even negligence, but let's say you own a construction company, somebody slips and falls, you are an interior designer, you install a piece of furniture that then falls on somebody. Somebody could sue you or make a claim and that would generally get filed under your general or be paid under your general liability. The professional liability insurance is for those typically in the more professional circumstances. It's not just your doctors, it's your agents, it's your architects, your engineers. Um, actually, they're starting to uh, massage therapists will also be required to have errors and omissions. And the way this insurance works is that in the event that you cause harm to someone through your negligence, bad information, um, a routine that is, is injurious to someone, then they can shoot, sue you under your professional liability, your errors and omissions. There are times when you will need both types of general or of both types of liability policies because one protects your intellectual property, the other protects your physical business. Does that make sense, ladies? Do you have any questions here? It does make sense. I'm, I, also, I just dropped one of mine. One is more expensive. I think it was the um, errors and omissions. Mm -hmm. The errors and omissions. The regular one. Mm -hmm. So the error and omissions is more expensive because you're, t you're, you're protecting against your intellect, basically. Mm. Uh -huh. Okay. So that's the intellectual property insurance then? It's not intellectual property. You're, when I say you're protecting your intellect, it's the advice, the services that you're giving as a, as a means of your abilities. Yeah. So when I got it, I remember my agent saying, like if someone says, Sammy, you wrote a resume and you get, I would get a job and I didn't get a job, so I'm suing you. Yes. That is exactly right. Okay. Yeah, because when it says errors and omissions, I feel like my mind kind of goes to like everything. So that's a good example. Mm -hmm. That's a perfect example. That's exactly what it does. Um, you make a recommendation that costs some money and then it could, they could file suit against your errors and omissions. All right, 
And then a good example of general liability is this example. This was an actual case that happened here in New Jersey. And this involved a restaurant. So a gentleman and his wife, Mr. Donovan, celebrated dinner with his wife at a local restaurant. As he came out of the restaurant, he actually slipped and fell. Resulted in memory loss, cognitive or neurologic, neurological issues. Um, he could no longer smell, all of, the, uh, uh, all of which are symptoms, no taste, all of which are symptoms of the neuro loss of neurological um, ability, right? Mm -hmm. He sued. And if you look on the upper right hand, the award amount was at $750,000. And here's where it kind of breaks down for you why the general liability is important. Because the owner of the actual property, the development, Douglas Development, ended up having to pay $745,000 of that award. Mm. The actual cafe that he had had dinner with, at, with his wife, they ended up having to pay $5,000 out of that award. Wow. So then he That's sued right. both of them, the cafe and the development agency? Exactly, which is why when you're renting property, they will ask to typically be coded as um, an additional insured on your policy. Mm. So a lot of business owners, um, whether they are renting a space or if they somehow are attached to another entity that has uh, um, exposure through that organization. So for example, I have people who consult with large universities. The universities ask to be considered or placed as certificate holders or additional insureds on their insurance policies. Why? Because if they're ever if the consultant has ever sued, the university wants to make sure that they are able to not only attach their own insurance policy, but the consultants as well. So they pay less. They pay more for the insurance policies, but it's to protect them from having to pay more it, when they're sued. It's to make sure that there's a policy in place to actually pay the award if they are. Yeah, yeah. Because if they don't have it, I mean, no one gets anything. <laughs> if they have it, then it can put a business owner out of business, right? Yeah, having to have, right, exactly. They would not be able to. Interesting. Okay. Right. Because this award was small, $5,000 for the cafe. Yeah. What if it was a million dollar award that they were responsible for? Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. All right. So the other thing that general liability does is not only does it help to cover the actual monetary award, it can help cover attorney's fees to defend, mm. which a lot of people don't realize. Um, and there is, right, there's value in that because a small business the best attorneys are not going to cost you $50 an hour. And if it takes that long, I'm seeing that it takes three years. I mean, you're paying someone for three years of work. You're paying attorney's fees for three years. Right. And the clock starts the minute you file the claim against your policy. It will help start paying those attorney's fees. That's great. Right, and so you're right, because a lot of people don't realize these cases don't settle overnight. Three years is actually a short time frame. Yeah. All right, so in considering that, a lot of small business owners will purchase what we consider a BOP or a business owner's policy. And this policy will combine the general liability or the professional liability and the property coverage. 
And when we talk about property coverage on the commercial side, it's typically not the physical building because that is covered usually through a different type of policy or the building owner will cover the building and you are covering the contents within your walls. So if you're leasing, the property manager, like real estate wise, will, will be covered under theirs usually? Correct. Oh, okay. Right, so what we're covering under the property is the signage, the computer, the personal property. So how does that work for like me? I have a home-based business. So for home-based businesses, it gets a little, um, it depends on the carrier, to be honest, Sammy. Okay. What, of what the extent of the coverage that they'll offer, because they may they might not call it. They might not call it BOP, but I'm sure it's something, right? Well, they may they may add a rider or an, what we call an exclusion onto your homeowners. So you need to be if you're working at home, you need to disclose that to your homeowner's insurance carrier. Okay. Because if you're trying to cover what we're talking about here, right? Your inventory, your computers, the other property that's tied to your business, you wanna have that be separate and apart from the overall, if something happens, you know, most people have, I don't know, that you had 75000 in personal property coverage under your homeowner's policy. Well, that's going to be separate and different usually from what's covered for you, just your business. Does that make sense? Yeah. I have a question about that. Now that people from COVID are like, a lot of them are, you know, closing their businesses for now and working from home, does the BOP have anything that you can put in there? Like if some kind of something happens and I have to work from home, um, my business is still like it's still protected even though you're not using it at that moment? So, but you want to disclose to your carrier that you're working from home so that it's covered. Like even just temporarily, because I know some people are just doing that temporarily right now. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's better to disclose it to the carrier so that they know and then can make the decision. Okay, that makes sense. And remember, it typically follows the business. Mm. So wherever the business is being, um, Hosted out of is where the coverage applies. Mm. Okay. All right. The business umbrella. Business umbrella is important because it it really it does just what it says it does. It covers your general liability, your auto exposures, so that in the event you are having to pay out an award. The umbrella would pay in addition to any of the policies listed here, your errors and omission, your general liability, your property, your auto, your directors and officers, your medical. It's important because as we say here, your tort liability for small businesses in 2008 was $105.4 billion. Okay, for an idiot, what does that mean, tort? <laughs> uh, shorthand, small businesses yeah. paid out $105 billion in lawsuits. Small business, okay. Just because I'm not new to this. <laughs> and of that, $35.6 billion came out of pocket. Right, so really 
often it, that, to me, it says that number came out of pocket, that 35 billion, because people weren't adequately insured. Clearly, yeah. Right, and That's so- absurd. That's crazy to me, that number, wow. Because people don't, they get the bare minimum, because somebody told them, well, my landlord says I need a million dollars in general liability. And that's what they get. They don't ever think, you know, if somebody trips and falls outside uh, on, the, on the pavement outside of my business and sues me because I didn't clear the snow in time enough. Mm. And they don't realize they can bundle this stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't realize that they can bundle it under the umbrella. So that's important, yeah. Yeah, because the umbrella would pay in addition to, right? So if you've got a million dollar general reliability policy, but the award is five million, and you've got another two million under the umbrella, well, now you've paid three, and you're only on the hook for two. Yeah. So do you need the umbrella for your personal policies and your business policy? It is not a bad idea. And on the personal side, umbrella policies are pennies on the, on the dollar. They are. They are. They're really cheap. Yeah. I think my umbrella policy is, it's a million for mm -hmm. like $20, 20, maybe, maybe like $30 a year, I think. Yeah. It's really inexpensive. That's good to know. I mean, yeah. I'm only asking, I have a small business, but it's not, not like I would get insurance because it's just selling stuff online. It's not like a full on business, but my dad has a bunch of small businesses. So I'm like going to relay the information. <laughs> yeah. It's again, another way to protect your per. And remember one of the reasons why you want these insurances as business owners is because it protects your personal assets mm -hmm. because if you get sued and can't pay. What are they coming after? Oh, if yeah. business is defunct and has no cash, what are they getting, what are they attaching next? You personally. Yes. Right? Yep. Yeah. Um, That's a nightmare. It is a nightmare, you know, and even on the personal side, I know we had a client who was involved in a horrible wreck. Mm -hmm. And I mean, she was hospitalized for like six months. And so that tells you how bad it was, right? Because hospitals don't keep you for a day. Yeah. And the accident was not her fault. She sued. Um, even with insurance, because the other party did not have a high enough limits on their insurance. Um, they ended up garnishing that person's wages. Wow. So you always want to make sure, I mean, you, I understand everybody has a budget, but you don't want to always go for the lowest price policy as a business owner. Mm -hmm. All right. So now we're on the equipment breakdown and coverages. Um, equipment breakdown. Um, you know, this is, you've got commercial freezers in your restaurant and you want to insure against loss, which is typically the types of policies or, or where we see those types of coverages. Your inland marine is not what you think it would be. This, because most people think, oh, inland marine um, that is some type of policy for a, a seagoing vessel. Nope. It is derived or it's, these are old policies, meaning inland marine insurance was first developed when we were a, most trade was facilitated through ships and cargo transport mm -hmm. through transatlantic mm -hmm. trade. Um, but it really is the protection of the underlying cargo or equipment. I flooding. I was like, inland marine, like inland water. 
<laughs> oh, that makes so much sense though, because historically it used, it used to, a lot of the trade was on water and now that makes sense. Right, so when a ship went down, the cargo is to protect it through the inland marine insurance. So if you, I had a client who owned a catering company who kept a lot of her supplies in her personal car, which is a note. Um, so it went under her personal auto, but who had an inland marine policy she could have, so the car was broken into and her, a lot of her restaurant and catering equipment was stolen. Mm -hmm. She did not have coverage for that because she did not have an inland marine policy, nor did she have a commercial auto policy, mm -hmm. right? So that's why you don't always want to keep your, even if you're using, utilizing your car for personal and business, you may want to look into a commercial auto policy for the coverage mm -hmm. um, because the personal auto only covered like five thousand dollars worth of damage or stolen goods and she had much more than that in the car um, had she had an in the marine policy she could have covered all the equipment if you're a contractor they typically have in the marine policy so you know, these small contractors who have a truck, anything that's in that truck should be covered under the inland marine policy. But so her, they're delivering it. Yeah. her business equipment isn't insured under her business policy? She didn't have a business policy for it. So she had no business insurance? She had general liability. She didn't, so have, not... she didn't have a brick and mortar place, so it wouldn't have been covered under that. Wow. And so this is timely because I'm actually up for renewal and I'm looking yeah. for, I didn't even think about it until you started talking today, like the Kim does insurance. So I'm going to send you my policy so you can review and let me know if I need this stuff. Okay. And also, here's the other thing. Inland Marine is utilized for people who are transporting things. That so, would be my dad. Yep. Mm-hmm. So if you're a medical supply company that's delivering, okay. you'll want inland, right? So it doesn't apply to everybody. If you have a brick and mortar and most of your things are in that brick and mortar, then inland marine would not apply to you. It applies for people who are in transition. So I think about like I, before COVID, um, I do a lot of workshops. So I have my computer in my car. I have a portable projector and screen in my car. So if I get into an accident and that stuff is damaged, it's not covered under anything? It, depending, on your <laughs> depending on your policy, it could be. Okay. All right, Kim, you'll get my policy. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> and so I just talked to my dad. I said, do you have an inland marine policy? He's probably going to be like, what? Am I like, what? <laughs> Oh, that's great. Yeah. And I often will say it depends um, because the language is different in different policies versus different carriers. There's usually commonality, um, but you want to read your language. And it's also dependent on your situation, right? If you are somebody who's primarily home based, or brick and mortar based, you probably don't need an in the marine policy. If you're a trucker, if you are constantly, if you're a delivery service, right, those businesses need inland marine. Mm -hmm. All right, so the next is commercial auto. Commercial auto allows you to cover just the liability coverage, meaning if you are sued because somebody who um, works for you and or is in your commercially covered auto is involved in an accident, you can at least cover the bodily injury to another, property damage, and your legal fees. It will not cover damage to the actual vehicle, to your actual vehicle. It'll just cover the liability in the medical, all right? Okay. 
So that is one thing you can do. And people will sometimes elect just to cover liability under their commercial auto because they can either outrightly pay for any damages because through cash flow um, or because um, they're taking higher limits. They're covering the liability side, two, three, four, five million dollars in coverage. Okay. If you have collision and comprehensive coverage to your commercial auto policy, then you can cover the physical vehicle. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So would you have commercial and personal auto insurance or just one? Um, are we talking for the same vehicle? Yeah. Just one. Okay. It's either or. Okay. And it's on usage. If you primarily utilize your vehicle for business, you might want to look into a commercial auto policy. Okay. How, how do the rates compare to personal? So, <laughs> I'm about to say, it depends. <laughs> yeah. <sure. laughs> um. And part of what drives the premium on commercial policies is what, what type of business do you do? Okay. Currently, are, are you transporting people ever in that vehicle? Mm. Are you asking me? No, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's, that's kind of right. So, but those yeah, are right. things yeah. that are considered when, when you're going through the underwriting process for the commercial policy, and that's partially what will drive your premium. Okay. I wonder how it is with like um, food trucks, you know, like if people decide like, I'm just gonna drive my food truck instead of having a car. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay, you really need to, that's your personal, but like, that's a business. <laughs> no, you've gotta have mm -hmm. policies for the food trucks. Oh, mm. totally. Yeah. Um, I'm not even sure that there are any, like a progressive would cover it, but it, they would cover it under their commercial policies. Right, exactly, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so this is a big one right now. It's the cyber yeah. life. Um, and when I saw this stat, I was like dumbfounded. 60% of small businesses close their doors within six months of a data breach. That's horrible. And it's not necessarily because they are bankrupted from the actual breach, right? It's not because somebody came in virtually and stole money. It's because of the notification to your clients, the credit monitoring, the awards to the client if their data was used illegally. We actually had a very timely uh, presentation on ransomware and they said something very similar. They were saying like, you would think businesses close because of their data being breached, but really it's a complex thing. It is. Yes. And so, you know, it's now mandated that you have six months or you provide credit monitoring for at least six months if you're breached. So that's not a big deal if you've got five clients who were exposed or five clients. It becomes a big deal when you've got 500 or 1,000. Mm -hmm. You can go to jail, right? For not having the liability claim or not being able to get their data back or something? It depends on your profession. I know for CPAs, that's a big deal. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And it might even be predicated by state law. So I know in like Pennsylvania, CPAs are required to have cyber liability coverage. Yeah. Yeah, he was saying, the, the presenter, he was saying um, 
um, like getting coverage for these ransomware attacks and that kind of thing. And he was saying that they jumped up after the pandemic for health insurance companies. Um, these attacks jumped up like a ridiculous percentage, you know, like they're taking advantage right now. Yeah. Well, because they knew people are, are needing health coverage, health insurance coverage, and that's an e quick and easy. You get every, right? You get every, every piece of data on a person, their full name, yeah. their social security number, their date of birth. And then what I try to say to people is, um, even if you're small business, does your company accept online payments? Mm -hmm. Oh no, are we paused? Am I paused? No, I think Kim. Oh no, Kim's paused. I Kim, hope are you phone there? Didn't die. Phone technology is very difficult sometimes. <laughs> I know. I know. Oh no. Oh, she might be back. Are you there, Kim? So if you accept online payments or credit cards, if you use technology, um, <laughs> which we all do, right? And what yeah. most people don't is if that technology is stolen and somebody gets access to that, that's considered a data breach. It's considered what? That can be considered a data breach. Oh, so, that is a data breach, right. Yeah. If, if somebody, if you leave your laptop in a cab or Uber or a Lyft and somebody is able to break into that laptop, that's a data breach. Right. But the cyber liability insurance is also another expensive one. I was going to add that one on, but it was like the, the same cost as my entire coverage. It, it is not expensive, but it's not, it's, it is, the cost is associated with what you're covering, right? Mm. If you're replacing, if you're doing credit monitoring for a year, or six months mm. for clients, and you've got a book of client, a large book of clients. That's costly. Mm -hmm. Does that get bundled in any BOP type of type of thing, or it's always a separate policy? So most BOPs. Um, so it depends on the carrier. So some carriers do pr provide a small you know, thousand or $5,000 coverage, that's not gonna cover anything. Remember this policy not only covers the credit monitoring, it will cover sending out or the notifications mm. clients that you have been breached. Mm. Um, you know, so that covers either the cost or salary of somebody to that you hire to do that. It co can cover postage, um, for the mailings and your supplies, it can cover um, the, the physical, meaning now you need somebody to come in and really beef up your security system. Right. That can be covered under your cyber liability. And then what I say to clients is do not, one of the things you can do, or a couple of things, um, which is on the next slide, is restrict potentially access to risky websites. Mm -hmm. Remind employees to be aware of phishing emails. So if you get an email that says, your bank of, uh, we need you to verify your Bank of America account and you know you don't bank with Bank of America, do not open it. Do not click on it. Just hit delete. Do you know, actually, you might find this interesting. At the library, these, these are all very 
smart things for the library too. Um, we change our passwords like every six months, but we had a previous director email us um, and it was from her previous email, but it was like, she didn't use that email anymore. She didn't work there anymore. And mm -hmm. it was asking for money to put into a gift card for one of the employees that was pregnant. So it was that researched that they knew who this person was. They got their email. They fished for money from everyone think like as a something that would definitely happen. Like someone would definitely except for her because she didn't work there anymore. Be like, Oh, let's get money for this person that's pregnant. So they and, knew the person was pregnant. They knew all these details and they tried to fish. So and crazy. Immediately, it was insane. And we all immediately got an email saying, do not open this. This is fake. Like, but like these people put time into these things. Right, because she had probably been hacked and they were watching her email or reading her emails behind the scenes in yeah. order to be able to put that stuff together. Uh, yeah, really I had never heard of anything like that happening that detailed until that happened to us. So it is important to have cyber security and safety for sure these days so kim i have a question like you know yarnique is my social media manager right mm -hmm. so she's a 1099 so do i need to have any type of insurance for my 1099s no but it's not unreasonable to ask them to have it okay so they can insure themselves yes okay and you might even want to be asked to be considered or named as an additional insured or certificate holder on that policy. Okay. So that if she's doing work on your behalf and something occurs and she is sued or you are sued because of work that she did, then you can attach her policy. You're covered under your policy and potentially hers. Okay. And, um, yeah, so that's a big one. If it looks suspicious, don't open it. Yeah. Okay. Um, we, I worked with somebody on the financial services side who received an email from a client asking that he wire her money. Um, and again, what Colleen would say, it was very detailed, like wire money to my Oregon address. So this person knew that this woman had more than one home. Mm. Um, and the only reason the advisor thought it was suspicious was because this woman had never requested um, money through an email before she usually picked up the phone and called him so you know there are some standards that we i know it's always easier to send an email or a text um but I, even when i'm working with people i say do not there's certain information that i say call me with this information do not include it in an email or a text um Password. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And I don't care if you, what system you have, right? The software to protect us is constantly updating because, you know, some people really do make a, a living out of crime. Oh, yeah. So they're constantly trying to breach that software that we're implementing. Yeah, they're um, always adapting, they're getting yeah. smarter. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's just some stuff you should never put in email or text. Mm -hmm. So in regards to passwords, strong and complex passwords, this is a big deal. Um, and you don't want to leave your passwords in a space or, or a place that other people can access. If you're leaving, if you, uh, you certainly don't want to continually utilize the same password across platforms. I'm bad with that. <laughs> yeah, no, yep. I get it because, right, everything requires a password.
So there are sources or platforms that will allow you to record your passwords. Um, yeah, they were telling us about that in the ransomware one. I wrote them down. There's a couple where you write yeah. all your passwords and it's encrypted and you have to go in and then they're all there for you. Exactly. Um, I keep a written list myself. And I know at one point my kids would make fun of me and be like, why do you actually have a list of passwords? It's smart. <laughs> I have a spreadsheet. Yes. Um, Cause you do, you need to, and here's a case. I don't know if you can see this. Oh, now I can see it better. Yeah. But this was a company that this was another case that was hacked because their, the controller used a password of one, two, three, four. The controller. Wow. Yes. Wow. That the controller would know better than one, two, three, four. Um, she left the system on. And so we, I know I sometimes am bad at this or I'll leave the laptop on overnight. You, know, you gotta log off. You gotta let the com system completely shut off because otherwise the hackers can get in even if asleep, right? Um, this cost this company $50,000 because they were able to hack into their accounting and banking software. That is, oh, that's awesome. All right, so do not use simple passwords and do not use the same password across plat platforms. Mm -hmm. I remember I had to change mine once because my something got breached on like some shopping site I had been on like once and they were like, mm -hmm. sign up for 10% off. And I'm like, okay, so I made, an, I made an account, used my password and then I got an email saying it was breached and I spent, I swear, two hours hunting down every single like shopping website I had ever been to that I could remember every single account I had and I had to change all my passwords and it was a nightmare. <laughs> it is. It's time consuming. It was very time consuming. So now they're all different. <laughs> and it's easy, right? I, I don't know about you. I first started shopping online. I was using the same platform for the online sites. And then I would use a different uh, password for my email accounts, but that's not enough. If it's a different, if you've got two or three email accounts, they need to have, you had need to have two or three different passwords. You know what someone said? Um, I don't know where they said this, but I should do this. They said um, for the site that you're on, use the first letter of that site and then use your password. So like if you're uh -oh. on, gmail make your password like g and then whatever your password is and then if you're on like shopify make it like s whatever the password is or sh whatever the password is because that'll like trigger in your head and it's easy to remember that right. and i was like oh my gosh that's so smart <laughs> i still wouldn't remember i'd be there on my yeah. temp try like what is it <laughs> and then you're like hey i'm on i'm on etsy it's e whatever my password is you know like it seems like smart i don't know Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that that is that is a good way, you know. You just want to make sure you you're doing as much as possible to protect yourself to make it harder for them. Yeah, and then as business owners, it's not a bad thing to have established email and internet usage policies and procedures for your employees. Mm, right. Business succession. We're not really going to talk about this in detail, but um, I put this slide in because I think it's important as business owners, we don't talk about it enough. But the decisions that we make today will impact how your business, your coworkers, and your families will move forward following an event such as death, disability, resignation, or retirement. And that brings us to short and long-term disability policies. As small business owners, we often don't think about this type of coverage. Um, we won't really go into the long-term disability because that typically piggybacks off the short-term. Uh, 
long-term disability is very inexpensive compared is to the really? short term. Hmm? Is it really? Why is that? Because most people never get to the long-term disability. It's so cheap. Long -term, if I had a chronic, well, I have a chronic illness. So long-term, if I started working somewhere, I mean, I'm not aware. I know my policy is very strong from the library and the city and all that stuff. But um, if I started working somewhere else uh, and they didn't know I had a chronic illness or whatever, I would have to be covered under long-term. Is that it? Mm, short-term. It would so, be short-term. Yes. If you're going to buy a supplemental policy, so this is the other thing. If you are working for someone or have coverage under an employer, meaning you have short-term disability coverage through your employer, that mm -hmm. policy will pay somewhere, typically 60% of your salary, right? Mm -hmm. You can buy an additional policy for yourself. For the rest of it. Okay. And it's still not going to make the rest of it, but it'll get oh, you typically yeah. to about somewhere between 80, 90%. Right. Because I'm a diabetic and the insulin is insane and the me medical supplies and all that stuff. So anytime I get a new job, I have to really look at the benefits very, very closely. Mm -hmm. And the reason short term you do, because, and this is where people don't, always calculate or maybe they do right because you say you're taking a look you need to you read your your benefits package sounds like we're fine well, then if I didn't have to <laughs> mm -hmm. um but short-term disability mm -hmm. the average american who actually utilizes a disability policy is going to utilize short-term disability and one in three to four workers actually use a short-term disability in their lifetime or what the statistics say. Yeah, because think about it. If you are injured, whether it's on or off the job, whether it's a sickness or a physical injury, how long are you typically going to be out? Are you going to be out for a week, two weeks, three months, or are you going to be out six months to 24 months? Most long-term disability policies don't kick in until you've been out of work for six months. Well, how many so where people- would COVID, Where would COVID fall in with this situation? Because I know if you have it, you have to quarantine for like 12 days. Short-term. So the typical short-term disability policy has what we call elimination periods. So those are time frames where you're sick or injured um but the policy hasn't kicked in yet so f most employers pick a seven to 14 day elimination period right you've got to be out of work for seven days if it's a seven day elimination or 14 days if it's a 14 day elimination period before you're allowed to file a claim but if you're out 14 days day 15 you can file for short-term disability they will then make up back pay for those previous 14 days you were out and pay you until you're able to return to work. Most policies that people purchase, especially through an employer, that short-term disability will pay for um, somewhere between 90 days to 120 days. So it'll either pay for three months or for six months. If you're still unable to return to work, then the long-term disability would kick in. Long-term disability could potentially pay to your social security retirement age. But that's not where most, that long-term disability is very, compared to the short-term disability is not used, utilized very frequently. If you're gonna purchase a policy as a small business owner, you're gonna wanna look at short-term disability, you're gonna look at your elimination period, because that will predicate your premium. You're gonna look at the duration of the policy. How long do you want the policy to pay? If you're purchasing the policy for yourself, you can have it pay up to 24 months, which is two years. The longer you have the policy pay, the, the longer the duration, the higher the premium is going to be. And it is also predicated on your actual salary. 
most um, business owners will need, or most carriers will ask for business owners to provide two years of tax returns. So you can't just pick a number out of the hat on what your salary was or what you made or what your business made. You need to potentially be able to show proof. Uh, it's still, you know, a good policy to have, especially in times of COVID as business owners, because if you can't work and you are the primary or your business is the primary business uh, income generator in your household, how do you replace that if you're in the hospital? Short-term disability. All right, so that brings us to key man insurance. Key man is a way for business owners to not just protect their business and the, if they have partners, but it's a way to potentially um, protect the business if there is a key employee who, if something were to happen to that employee, if they are sick, for a long period of time, if they leave the company, how do you replace that essential person to your business? Key man insurance can be one of them. Key man is basically life insurance that partners will take out on one another. So in the event that something happens and I need to buy out the other person, there's money to do so. And You'll hear examples of this. I like to use um, this example. If you are in business with, so I actually had a, a couple who had divorced. They owned a restaurant together. They still maintain the restaurant. They had each remarried. The question became, if something were to happen to either of you, would you want to be in business with the new spouse? And the answer was no. So how do you protect against that? How do you make sure that there's enough money to buy out the other person? Yeah, like who's the key man out of those two? <laughs> <laughs> well, you buy it on each other. Okay. So they each bought a policy based upon the value at the time of their business so that if happened to either party, they could buy out the other spouse. Are you able to do that without the other person knowing? Not anymore. Okay. You used to be able to, but now most insurance companies want to make sure that you have what we call or consider an insurable interest. And so because... <laughs> because you had people buying policies on spouses that they didn't know were or were aware of and then you know doing illegal things um the insurance carriers responded to that by now you've got to not only have what we consider insurable interest but they may actually notify or and or often require the signature of that person mm -hmm. um and because it's life insurance, there is an under, um, you, you have to go through an underwriting process, right? That includes medical. So how do you get those medical records for that person? Okay. How do you, you know, it usually, well, not, oh, not usually, but it can involve um, needing blood samples and urine. Well, you can't do that without notifying the person unless you're really, really devious. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking that, like, well. <laughs> if you, where there's a well, there's a way, so. <laughs> and then the other way that these policies are sometimes utilized um, is on key employees because you'll purchase what, a whole life policy over from the policies who allow the cash value to build up so that when the employee is ready to retire, they now have an additional source to pull from because uh, they have 
cash value and or you pull it out and give it to them in a lump sum. Yeah, and a lot of people don't think about that. It's funny because I was having this conversation this morning with someone that oftentimes people think of life insurance as death insurance, but it's not necessarily. It is exactly what it says it is. It's for when you, it's for your life. It's for when you're living. And these are the strategies that you can utilize, right? While you're alive. Yeah. To overfund it, to pull out the cash value for retirement. And it's a great way if you don't have the means of necessarily establishing or maybe you don't have um, W-2 employees, but you have a, a, an essential 1099 employee or you have a W-2 employee, but you can't, you only have one. So you, you're not in a position to maybe establish um, a traditional 401k or some type of, you know, group retirement plan. Mm -hmm. This is a great way to do it. And then um, I always include this slide because the question is often whole life versus term. For a lot of these strategies, the only way to accomplish, well, that's not true. You often see whole life policies purchased for the strategies that I was just talking about, meaning the key man and the key life because of the cash value component. But sometimes if based upon the valuation of your business, you might need term life insurance. And this is just a good example of why or the difference between term and whole life. Really, it's, the, it's predicated on your age, your gender, and your health for all types of policies, right? Mm -hmm. But here we can clearly see a one-year-old female on the left side, the annual premium is $286. By the time she is 65, I'm looking at that same blue graphic, that same policy is now gonna cost her $4,245 a year. So the earlier you start, the better. Yes. All right, so that's how age impacts your premiums. Now let's look at how a whole life versus a term life impacts your premiums. So if we're looking at the blue graphic, an 18 year old female, the annual premium on a $100,000 policy is $469. If you go to the green graphic, at age 18, that same policy with for a 10 year term policy, $100,000 is $137.28. So term, is in, is, term insurance is less expensive, but because it's only in place for a term or duration of time, it may end up costing you more long term. And it doesn't have the cash value. And it doesn't have the cash value. Okay. And that, ladies, is really kind of it. Those are the types of policies we most frequently encounter. Um, workers comp would be another big policy for business owners. We did not touch on that today. But workers comp is important if you have employees because it will help you pay their medical expenses. It will help you cover attorney's fees if they should, if they should sue you mm. and potentially um, even their salary. And people will ask, well, how does workers' comp come into play? So here's an example of workers' comp. Had a... Um, business owner who had an employee who slipped and fell in the ladies room. Mm. 
they were not even in their office. They were off site attending a workshop. She, you know, during break, went to the ladies' room. Somehow she slipped and fell. She hit her head on the back of the commode. She used her arm to try to break the fall. So she concussed herself and broke her arm all at the same time. Wow. I'm like terrified of that. Oh, wow. I know it's horrible, but because they had workers comp, they were able to, right? She was transported to ER through an ambulance. Cost so much. Right. But it was well, it depends. Workers' comp premiums are based upon the employee's salary. So it's based upon your employee's salary plus the number of employees you have. It's also predicated on the type of business, right? Yeah. So you are a carpenter. You are going to pay more than an office worker. Mm-hmm. Because the chance of injury increased the flip side is if something happens and you now have to pay the medical bills for that employee would you want it to come out of your pocket you're gonna pay for it somehow so do you want it to come out of your pocket especially if you do not provide medical insurance for your employees Mm. so again some of these laws are in place because if a business isn't mandated to have, and this is, I mean, we're not going to get into the health insurance because it's another hour conversation just on that. Oh, wow. Yeah. In America. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm, I'm talking even just for the fundamentals, right? Like right. what do you look at, blah, blah, blah. But, because so many small business owners can't afford to offer medical insurance, this is a way to make sure that there's some type of coverage in place to protect the employee. For accidents mostly, yeah. Yes. It, okay. So it can, re, it, medical, attorney, if they sue you, um, salary to help replace their salary while they're out of work or some type of short-term disability kind of coverage that's wrapped into it. Um, the other thing is, don't let, uh, it's kind of morbid, but in the event that it is fatal, it helps to cover um, final expenses. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it makes sense to have. All right. In addition to um, defending you, I think I said that in court. So workers is actually a very valuable policy if you are a business owner. It sounds who, like it. Yeah. Yep. If you're a business owner who has employees, you need workers comp. Okay. All right. Any questions, ladies? I know we covered a lot. No, that was good. That was great. I learned a lot. Me too. Oh, good. Good. Well, I'm That's- glad that you uh, set this all up and we got our tech working and everything. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's- well, when we open back up, we'll have to do another something like this if you're if you're willing. <laughs>